better sleep, how to get your kids on board, which is uh, your live webinar today with myself and Dr. Nicole Birkins. Uh, Dr. Nicole is a holistic child psychologist, best-selling author and mom of four. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist uh, and board certified nutritionist specialized in, which is actually an unusual combination um, and very important because of such overlap between mental health and nutrition. And she specializes in the evaluation and treatment of children with serious developmental and mental health conditions. And she is our newest and uh, most exciting addition to the Apollo Neuroscience Advisory Board, Scientific Advisory Board. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. So happy to be here. I was looking forward to this on my schedule this week. So, Well, we are uh, really glad to have you. Um, this has been a while in the making. Um, and for those who, I'm sure everybody knows me, but for those who don't, I'm uh, your host, Dr. Dave Rabin. I'm a psychiatrist and neuroscientist. Um, as, as well as the Chief Innovation Officer and Co-Founder of Apollo Neuroscience. I'm also the Executive Director of the Board of Medicine uh, and, uh, mo and practice uh, and specialize mostly in uh, trauma and addiction psychiatry. Um, I personally do not work a lot with kids, which is why I try to spend a lot of time with my colleagues like Dr. Nicole, who do, because I learn so much about um, how to actually treat adults better when I spend more time with my pediatric colleagues, because really, um, you know, adults are just big babies <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and we have the same needs uh -huh. so, like sleep. Uh -huh. um, so, and just uh, so everybody remembers how we do these webinars, um, we are going to have a little bit of a uh, back and forth conversation about some of the most uh, you know, important questions that uh, we get asked and also things that people have been sending in to us. We'll also have a Q&A at the end. Um, if you have questions, anyone listening has questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. If you put them in the Q&A box, then if, our, if we or our team can answer them during the webinar, we will. Um, and I will also let you know that our customer service team is available to answer any questions if you have issues about your Apollo device or things or questions you want to ask specifically about the Apollo device or the technology. Um, we'll be covering a little bit of that, but we won't be able to talk about or answer questions about specific things uh, respective to your situation or your life. Um, so if you have questions about that, please feel free to direct them to our customer service team and they are happy to answer them for you. Uh, and we will not be, we will be talking about some medical stuff in general and health stuff, uh, but we can't answer specific questions about your health and your medical, uh, individual medical situation, because we don't know you well enough to do that. So we'll do our best, the best we can to try to give some general information that can be helpful to you and your family. Um, but we won't be able to answer specific questions about your medical needs on this specific webinar. Um, that being said, Dr. Nicole and I are both practicing physicians uh, and clinicians. So if you do want um, to either an get answers to your personal questions, you can always reach out to us via our website, uh, our websites um, and set up an appointment, or you can uh, reach out to us and we can refer you to somebody in your area who can see you. So with that, um, I think Part of why we are so excited to have Nicole, Dr. Nicole on the Scientific Advisory Board of Apollo is because uh, we have seen over the years since Apollo technology was developed out of the University of Pittsburgh, um, we've seen a lot of kids using it. It wasn't originally developed for children, but it was developed for uh, vulnerable populations, people who are not good candidates for medicine, kids fall into that category, pregnant women fall into that category, veterans, people with PTSD, addiction disorders, and uh, elderly folks fall into that category. And so we ended up having a lot of practitioners clinic and clinicians who are working with children just using it because they wanted to try something different. Mm -hmm. And they started telling us about their experiences and families started telling us about their experiences and they were really promising and really exciting. And so that led us to start to um, investigate what we could do to help that community and and about educating and sharing information about um, what we can, you know, how, how to sleep better and how to live a healthier life and how to effectively help your kids live healthier and, and start doing so young. Because if you start doing anything young, 
as we all know, it becomes a lot easier when you get older um, and has long-term implications. So first off, Dr. Nicole, um, could we start by just, well, you feel free to tell us anything else that I missed about you and your background um, that you want to share. And also, maybe the first question I have for you is, why is getting good sleep so important for children? Mm. That it's such a foundational question, really, about why sleep is important, because I think it can't be overstated, the importance of sleep, particularly for kids. I mean, we know that for adults too, sleep is important for all of us, but especially when we're talking about kids who are still developing. You know, my background, um, you know, I started as a teacher actually, so I have experience there. And then for the last, you know, 20 some years in the realm of mental health, clinical psychology, then nutrition, being a parent myself in each of those areas of my background, I've had the opportunity to really see how important sleep is. Um, you know, all of you who are listening, who are parents, boy, you know how important sleep is for your kids. You know the difference in how your kid feels and functions and how uh, easily or uh, challenging it is for you the next day to get through what you need to get through. So you know, we sort of intuitively know, especially when we have children, we know how that feels for ourselves too. And, you know, I used to see that in the classroom with kids um, and certainly in my clinical practice with everything from kids who are diagnosed with conditions like autism, ADHD, uh, learning disabilities, behavioral disorders, those kinds of things. But even kids who come in who don't have a diagnosis or don't qualify for a diagnosis, but are struggling in one or more areas, Sleep is one of the key things that we look at because as important as sleep is for us as adults, it's even more important for kids because their brains and their bodies are growing. And sleep is one of the things that drives that growth physically, but also neurologically. And so we intuitively know that um, for little, little kids, we know like, oh, wow, newborns, infants, you know, toddlers, those early years, wow, they're growing so much. They're learning so many things. And it makes sense that they sleep a lot more. But I think we tend to underestimate or, or lose the focus on how important sleep is as kids get into the elementary years and certainly into middle school and high school years and even the young adult years where we're sort of expecting kids from middle school on to be able to function more like adults, maybe you know do homework until late at night, not get you know a lot of sleep. And the data is really clear that our kids, even our older kids, need to be getting enough good quality sleep and most of them aren't. And when kids don't get enough good quality sleep, we see problems across the board, not just with their you know, longer term development, but even in the short term from one day to the next, you know, there have been studies done showing that even 30 minutes of lost sleep for a child per night has a significant negative impact on their learning, their attention, their behavior, their emotional regulation the following day. And then we have research showing obviously over time, if a child at any age is chronically not sleeping well, they are at much greater risk for developing the entire range of mental health issues, you know, learning and attention challenges. So sleep is just really critical. And I discovered early on in my clinical work with kids and with families that I needed to be asking about what was going on with sleep and really prioritizing that in treatment plans because all the good other kinds of therapies and interventions in the world are not going to stick and work very well if a kiddo is not getting the sleep they need. So that's how important it is. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to think about it. I think the um, the the impact of just thirty minutes of mm -hmm. lost sleep a night on a consistent basis mm -hmm. is really interesting. Yeah. And to think about how, you know, 30 minutes doesn't really seem like that much, but when you think about the impact on, on learning and attention and the ability to be able to, you know, maintain your focus during the day, um, it's, it's quite significant. And it, it basically prevents our not having that extra recovery time prevents our, our brains from mustering the energy and the attention to be able to soak in the new information that we need to learn and not just take it in, but actually retain it over time. 
And, and I think you brought up a really good point that we don't talk about enough, which is that it's not just getting deep sleep. It's not just getting good quality sleep. It's also the consistency over time, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and why, because, because I think, and this is also important because I think that there's a lot of parents out there who are, you know, kind of fighting with the idea of, does my child need to have the same bedtime every night? Right. Right. Or do they need to be in the same kind of environment, sleeping mm-hmm. in the same place every night? And, and I personally do not know the answer. And so I'm curious, you know, yeah. what is most important? Is it most important to have the same bedtime or the same consistency of environment and bedtime or, and, and ha- what kind of impact does that have on, on kids? Consistency is really important on a number of levels. In the big picture, consistency in terms of consistently getting enough good quality sleep is critical because we understand now that you can't make up for it. You know, we think about like, well, you know, I didn't get good sleep for during the week or I didn't get enough, but I'll make up for it on the weekends. Um, And teenagers are a big one for that, right? You know, they'll sleep for a few hours and then I'll catch up on weekends. Well, we actually know now that that's not how it works, right? And and develop. we can talk about the developmental pieces of that, but we know that that's not actually how it works, that lost sleep is lost sleep, that you can't have poor quality or not enough sleep um, most of the time and just make up for it on vacations, on weekends, whatever. So the consistency is important. That's not to say that we don't all have nights periodically where we just don't sleep well. And certainly that's gonna happen for kids for a variety of reasons. So just to like help everybody relax around it, we're not talking about perfection here. There's no such thing with anything in raising kids and especially not when we're talking about sleep, but we are talking about on the whole, wanting to have consistent patterns of enough good quality sleep. That's what's gonna allow kids to feel and function best. Now, we can also look at consistency, some of the things that you were talking about in terms of uh, routines, in terms of what are the areas where consistency is important to help kids be able to fall asleep, stay asleep, get the sleep that they need. And so we are thinking about consistency of those sleep hygiene, we call them routines, sort of the bedtime routines, um, the environmental routines, even the waking up routines. Consistency with that, again, doesn't have to be every single uh, night. There are things that come up in life, but the vast majority of the time we're sticking to those routines. And especially when kids are younger, those routines are really, really important Um, Children of all ages, but particularly younger children, really need routine in order to support their ability to be emotionally, physically, behaviorally regulated. So the classic example is a family maybe that doesn't have any good um, established bedtime routines. And it's just sort of like chaos. Everything's different every night. Things happen at a different time. And then parents will come into the clinic and say, well, my child doesn't sleep or I can't get my child to sleep. One of the first things we look at is creating consistent routines. What's going on from the after dinner time through the bedtime? What do those activities look like? What is the timing routine looking like? Who's you know engaging with the child around these things? How are we setting up a structure and a schedule that's leading kids towards bedtime and being able to help their brain and body settle down to relax and go to sleep. And, you know, we just know that consistency with those routines, again, doesn't have to be exactly the same every night, but the general routines are what we need. And even when you do things like, you know, go on vacation or, you know, the holidays are coming, maybe going to grandma and grandpa's, whatever. um, Some of those routines are going to change, but there's core things that we can keep consistent Um, like we get our PJs on, we have a little snack, we brush our teeth, and then we, you know, sit on the couch together and read some books before going to bed that we can do anywhere. Right. So there's certain pieces of this that just really help kids, uh, know what to predict, which reduces their stress and overwhelm, which helps them to be able to settle down for sleep. And that's really what we're looking at with that consistency is a sense of, oh, I feel safe. I know what to expect. I can relax 
and that's going to be conducive to falling asleep. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting way to think about it, which actually leads into my next question, which was about how do you make bedtime fun? And I think that the the lead in is almost, you know, it's like, how do we create, we need some routines for consistency. Those routines don't have to be boring, right? What if the routines could start, could be fun routines that that maybe do not result in the, in our kids going to bed at exactly the same time every night, but right around the same time, we yeah. start to wind them down. That's right. right? And it's kind of reminds me of like something that's become really popular on TikTok, which is called the, oh, what is it called? Like the get ready videos, like oh, uh -huh. videos yeah. everybody's yeah. posting of watching right. people get ready and how yeah. exhilarating yeah. this is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe we need to popularize the wind down videos. Right. right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's important for, for parents to realize, I mean, this is true for us as adults too, but especially for kids, bedtime, you know, the, the ability to get a child in bed on time and help them fall asleep or have them be able to fall asleep doesn't start at bedtime. That process yeah. actually needs to start an hour, two hours, really after dinner. Like you want to be right. thinking about assuming you eat dinner sometime around, you know, six o'clock ish, whatever. Um, you know, especially if your child is younger, they're going to be in bed between seven, eight. If you have an older child, maybe nine, you know, a, a teenager, 10 at the latest. Um, but you're thinking about that as your wind down time and where I think fun is important from the standpoint of the personality of the child. Some kids are going to respond better um, to, you know, making up some games, you know, oh, let's see how quickly you can get your pajamas on, or I'm going to brush my teeth with you, you know, let's see who can get them the shiniest. Again, depending on the child's age, whatever, we can bring fun and lightness to it, especially if your child gravitates towards that. Where we want to be cautious, though, is equating fun or trying to like engage the child and make it exciting for them. We don't want to equate that with overstimulation, which can happen. And I'll give you the classic example is, you know, maybe a parent who works all day, who gets home late, maybe, you know, they get home after dinner or whatever. Um, the other parents trying to put the kids to bed and or, or getting them, you know, winding down. And then this parent comes in and it's like, oh, this is my playtime with the kids and starts roughhousing and playing, you know, chase games and airplane games and all of that. Um, that's real. Well, that's right. And while that's fun and kids love that, here's where we run into problems with that. Those activities are not conducive to helping their brain and body ease into a mode of sleep. So we can keep things fun and engaging and playful while also being mindful of not being overstimulating because that whole wind down period of time, we wanna be doing activities and things that settle the nervous system, that settle the body. So we're thinking about things like you know, maybe puzzles or, you know, playing with toys on the floor or reading books or going for a walk, things that are regulating and calming, not the, you know, racing around, not the chase games, not the wrestling matches, not the intense video games and things like that, that what that does is just revs up that kid's nervous system and tells them their, their brain like, oh, we're in revved up mode. And then, you know, parents are like, tearing their hair out over why can't I get this kid to go to sleep? Well, you haven't helped their brain get into the mode where sleep is something that they can actually do. So right. we have to think about that whole prep time of how can we be engaging? How can we, you know, be fun with that while also not being overstimulated? That, that's the balance. And, and I'll say like whether, I don't know if this fall, falls into the category of fun, but a great technique, especially for younger kids, or if you have a child maybe with some neurodevelopmental challenges or quite a bit of anxiety or those types of things, even a, a checklist kind of thing, which for little kids can be even some visuals of the steps you know, of our routine, 
Um, it can be a written list, but that can provide some structure for both the parent and the child. And a lot of kids, you, know, you can make that fun and engaging too. You know, we're going to laminate it and you're going to take your marker and cross them off as we go. Or I'm going to put a smiley face as we get each one done or put a sticker. You know, you can keep it engaging if that's what is going to benefit your child. There's different ways to do that. But sometimes, um, you know, just the, the structure and the visual of having a list or having, you know, some pictures of what we're going to do. That's kind of what those videos are, right? It's like walking through, it's the repetition of seeing, you know, those kinds of routines in action. And that can be really helpful for lots of kids, especially little ones. Yeah. Those are such good ideas. I could have benefited from those, some of those myself as a kid. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. the, I, I love the idea about, you know, making something like brushing your teeth fun mm -hmm. or like almost like, a you know, let's see who can get your teeth the shiniest, not right. let's see who can finish first. Uh, no, with right. teeth, that's that, not where the direction you want to go. <laughs> that is not the goal, right? The goal is let's right. see who can get the teeth the shiniest. Let's see, you know, thinking about like almost almost like the like the like the sheep counting game in yes. some ways, right? With yeah. with reading, you know, there are different ways that you can incentivize it sounds like what you're saying, there are different ways you can incentivize kids to kind of yeah. make the root, create a structure yeah. around the wind down period yeah. so that kids are kind of like almost uh, looking forward to yeah. this, mm -hmm. the things that they do because it gives them a sense of safety and comfort and routine. Right. And oftentimes that they are in control of to some extent, even though yeah. they're not it's really the parents that are in control, but it gives the perception that they're, right. they're actually, a, they're like, there's a critical part. And they're not just being told what to do. The That's whole right. Time. Well, and you can give kids choices within that too. And that's important right. with any routine. We create the overall structure of these are the things that need to happen. And we're in charge of the timing of that. That's our responsibility. But where we want to go is giving kids choice and agency within that structure and that timing. So, you know, you could um, get your pajamas on now and then have a snack, or we could have our snack and then you could get your pajamas on. You know, we can, you can choose um, these PJs or these PJs. Uh, you've got this choice or this choice for the song that we're going to play, you know, um, while you're falling asleep. We can read this book or this book. So you want to give kids choices. And that's particularly important if you have a child who tends to have maybe some resistiveness to authority or structure. Um, all kids go through phases with that. If you're raising a toddler or a preschooler right now, um, if you're raising a teenager right now, there are certain phases of development where there's just naturally more pushback against you know, authority and structure. And so you wanna look for ways to give choices within that. However, you're still controlling the overall structure. You know, It's not gonna be a choice to go to bed at 10 when your bedtime is eight. But the way that we orchestrate things between the seven o'clock and eight o'clock hour, I can give you a lot of choices and say in that. Um, the other piece I want to touch on around this, because I just think this is so important when, especially when children are not sleeping well, or when there's challenges around sleep, which I just want to normalize that for everybody listening. Most families go through that at some point or another. Um, sometimes that persists and you get families where you're really locked into, um, chronic patterns, either with all of your kids or maybe with a particular child around bedtime really being a struggle. And so I just want to normalize that that happens. And I'm glad that you're here and listening to this because it's important to address that. A lot of families will come in to the clinic after years and years of this going on. And it's easier to manage if you kind of can, can intervene along the way and not wait until it kind of reaches a crisis point. But one of the things that's key if you're dealing with that with your kids is to think about your own modeling and how you're engaging with your kids around bedtime. You know, you, you asked um, Dr. Dave about keeping it fun. One of the pieces of that um, is the attitude that we as the adult parent or other adult bring to the mix. And I just want to say, if you are a, a mom or dad who like bedtime has become the bane of your existence, like you get towards the bedtime hour and you're feeling stressed and angsty and like, oh, this is terrible. 
that's going to seep in and perpetuate that pattern of problems with sleep and getting ready for sleep with your kids. So Ain't you want to think about, yeah. I mean, you really want to think about the attitude that you bring to it and work on regulating your own emotions around that. Because if you're entering that time of day with dread and angst, and that's going to just increase the issues. And so you want to think about how can I approach this with more of a positive attitude? How can I, you know, show up in this situation with my child in a way that um, maybe is more playful or at least um, recognizes that, you know what, we're, we're working on this. This is going to get better. Um, you you want to really monitor your own attitude and your own behavior around that stuff. Um, sometimes, it's really important for parents to engage in pieces of these routines with the kids, like teeth brushing. I gave that as an example. I'm going to brush my teeth with you. Now, I don't care if you're not actually going to bed for, you know, three more hours, you're going to brush your teeth again. Fine. But a great way to help kids through those routines, especially if they're really resistant, is we're going to do it together. I'm putting my pajamas on. You're going to put yours on. I'm going to pick a book. You're going to pick a book. Um, I'm putting my device away and turning it off and putting it away. And we're doing the same for yours. That modeling is so, so critical. And I think we lose sight of how much kids are watching us and taking in, even when we don't think they are. And so this is, especially if you are um, parenting older kids right now, you know, you can't expect them to do what you say about like, you need to turn your screens off. You can't have this in your bedroom at night. Like you need to get to bed on time. If they are watching you and going, I know you're up until 2 a.m. I know your phone is right next to you in bed. I know you're you know doing these things. So we need to be conscientious about that. Um, building good sleep foundations and sleep habits is a family affair. We need to model what we're telling kids we want them to do if we are going to actually have a reasonable expectation that they do it. So I just think that's an important piece. Yeah, that's an incredibly important piece. And we forget often how much our kids look up to us as role models, even if they won't admit it, right. they are they are like sponges that are just constantly absorbing everything they see us do. And, you know, I don't, I didn't originally plan to ask you this question, but you are, you know, it's so rare that I have a, you know, mental health expert and nutritionist, uh, nutrition expert, you know, and you mentioned snacks, mm -hmm. you know, I think one thing that parents often forget about, because I, I know I never was educated well on nutrition, um, even in medical school and nutrition around bedtime, you know, what do you, yeah. what's good to eat for dinner that's mm -hmm. going to help you wind down for bed or what's good to snack on before bed that's actually going to help you go to sleep rather than keep you up. Do you have any suggestions for people around, uh, around food that you should either aim towards or maybe better even stay away from for your kids when they're in that uh, dinner to wind down bedtime period? It's, it's a great question. And parents ask this a lot and there's some good things to keep in mind. I mean, the obvious thing that most people are aware of is around caffeine, right? We want to, I mean, kids really should not be having caffeine as part of their regular uh, dietary intake anyway. But I understand, especially as they get into those later middle school and high school years that, you know, that can be an issue. But we really want to explain to kids the importance of not having that uh, later in the day, like two o'clock is really the absolute latest cutoff for that. So that piece is important. Sugar is another big one because blood sugar stability, keeping a kid's blood sugar nice and stable is conducive to helping um, regulate those sleep and wake cycles. And so we just want to be thinking about not loading them up on added sugars in the evenings. And so what do we do instead? Well, we focus on things like protein, healthy fats, steady carbs, which are carbs that come from things like fruits and vegetables from whole grains. Um, those are the things that we really want to focus on there. So, you know, kids might want for a bedtime snack. And by the way, it's very appropriate 
for kids of all ages actually to have a bedtime snack, especially, you know, younger kids, you think about they're sleeping for 12 hours, you know, an elementary age child, 10 to 12 hours, that's a long stretch. And depending on when they eat dinner, we actually do want them to have a snack because if they don't, they're likely to wake up in the night then because their blood sugar is too low. But we want to be mindful of what they're eating. So they might want, you know, a, a fruit roll up or they might want the ice cream or whatever. Well, we want to offer options that pair some of those proteins, healthy fats, you know, steady carbs. So maybe, you know, the options might be a banana you know, with nut butter, and maybe we can even sprinkle a couple of little chocolate chips on there to make it nice and, you know, fancy and appetizing. Or we want to cut up an apple, an apple with uh, nut butter, hummus with whole grain um, crackers, things that are pairing, um, you know, those fibers, those healthy fats, those proteins, that's what's going to keep a kiddo's blood sugar level stable and allow them to not only fall asleep, but stay asleep. Because some of you have kids that struggle with both of those pieces. They struggle with falling asleep and they're also not staying asleep. Some of you have kids who fall asleep okay, but they're up through the night. Um, and so we want to keep that blood sugar stable. By the way, this is a critical concept from a nutritional standpoint during the day as well. Blood sugar instability, that blood sugar roller coaster of spikes and crashes, um, you know, the typical, um, you know, breakfast that served in most school cafeterias, for example, of strawberry or chocolate milk, you know, a bowl of cereal, a muffin. Well, that's a ton of sugar spikes that blood sugar, we get hyperactivity, problems focusing, sort of manic kind of mood, and then it crashes quickly. And then they're lethargic, they're irritable, they're resistive, they're struggling. Um, and then a lot of kids- sleep in class. That's exactly right. And they're on that roller coaster all day long. And that is very connected to kids' um, mental health symptoms, to their ability to learn. So this idea of blood sugar stability is important across the board, but especially, you know, you want to be thinking about that for that evening, um, that evening snack hearing you talk about this is so enlightening because it's really making me realize everything I did wrong during my own childhood. <laughs> I'm like, yep, check, yeah, check right. all yeah. those things. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, I think that it's really important to note because I was one of those kids who was also, you know, eating, I ate a lot of carbs for breakfast and then I had exactly what you just described, right? Yeah. I was, I had, uh, a, you know, difficulty focusing and hyperactivity in the mornings. And then literally right after that was over, I would fall asleep. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I would get in trouble for both. Right. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Like, what? Yeah. And I couldn't, you know, I wasn't, was focusing particularly well. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think anybody, what's interesting about that too, thinking about it from, you know, my psychiatrist hat on, right. Is if you are eating that kind of diet, and not realizing the impact it has, you know, you could be accidentally misdiagnosed with ADHD. Totally. Right? Totally. I see that all the time. And this is why I'm so passionate about the nutrition and lifestyle pieces when we look at mental health for kids and for adults. Um, nutrition and sleep are two of the lowest hanging fruits that we can address for kids who are struggling. That does not mean that what kids are eating or how they're sleeping is 100% the cause of whatever challenges they may be having. However, the research is clear that those are important components. And so from a food standpoint, we have research data now showing that what kids eat absolutely sets them up for exacerbating problems with focus and attention, anxiety, mood, behavioral dysregulation, and the sleep piece too, you know, great example, you're talking about ADHD symptoms, you know, the, the, the research literature now tells us that between 25 and 40% of children who end up diagnosed for ADHD actually have an undiagnosed, untreated sleep problem. That when we address the sleep problem, for many of those kids, the ADHD symptoms completely resolve. For those where it doesn't completely resolve, it significantly improves their ADHD symptoms. And so this is just a key piece when any child presents to my clinic with any type of symptom concern in the realm of development, mental health, learning, whatever it might be, 
We've got to be looking at these pieces because these are things that we can relatively easily address that make a big, big difference then in the trajectory of how they're developing, of how they're functioning. And I see a lot of older kids who have been diagnosed with all kinds of things, put on all kinds of medications, they've spent years in treatment, but no one's addressed the foundations of things like are they getting the, the nutrients that their brain and body needs to function well so that their brain, their neurotransmitters can function? Are they sleeping enough and getting the quality sleep um, you know, that they can feel and function well? If we don't address those foundations, we can't really expect any of the other interventions that we might use to work very well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I see them just a few years later when they're right. adults and they yep. have the same problems and nobody has realized that perhaps they might not be right. sleeping or they might not be eating very well. And then, you know, they're already on like three or four medications at that right. point and they're not fixing the problem because they're still not sleeping. Right. So, so on that kind of segueing a little bit, you know, I think that one of the things that interferes with sleep a lot that we see a start in childhood is stress and stress from school, stress from expectations from your family, performance, who you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to express yourself. You're just, you know, you're, as a kid, you're just learning about what it's like to be a human being, right? Oftentimes there's not, nobody like hands you an instruction book and says, Hey, this is what you need to you know, follow all these steps to be human and everything's going to be okay. You know, that's, it's, it's usually you're kind of just thrown into the deep end and asked to, to swim as, as my wife would say. And, you know, I feel like there's a, uh, and for parents point. too, for right. parents too, right? there's no manual for any of this with raising kids. Right. So we're all in it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so, and we've all been through it because we've all been kids at one right. time dealing with stress and trying to figure it out. And, and so, you know, I think the, the stress thing is really interesting because, you know, stress has this way of not just hitting us on the sleep side, but it hits us in a different part by kind of making our our bodies putting our bodies into a state where we don't really feel safe right. and sleep is also like our one of our most vulnerable states of being ever because we're physically defenseless our our bodies are turned off to the you know environment around us and and you know really evolve to not allow us to enter that state if we are perceiving any kind of danger in the environment around us or any kind of potential threat mm -hmm. and I, we get a lot of questions about you know, stepping beyond the bedtime routine, right? Mm -hmm. Where kids might have some anxiety or some, or, or just, you know, stress from the day or racing thoughts or things like that. I know I did when I was a kid and just thinking about when, once you get into bed, so maybe you can get into bed. Okay. And you can mm -hmm. do the bedtime routine, but then you're lying in bed and you're kind of awake for half an hour, hour, two hours, and you're just kind of, not able to sleep, what kinds of things can kids do uh, or can parents do with kids to help them in those situations? And are there any tools in particular that you'd recommend? This is a really important one because again, we look at it from a developmental perspective. Almost every child will go through a phase at some point in their childhood of having nighttime fears. That's a really normal developmental piece of things usually happens in the later preschool to middle elementary years as the brain is coming online, we're being aware of more things to be afraid of, right? So, so that's typical. Some kids get stuck in that and that becomes a chronic pattern. Most kids will kind of, you know, work through that, but that's a typical piece, those nighttime worries. Some kids, especially kids who tend towards higher anxiety, maybe they have a neurodevelopmental disorder or a specific anxiety disorder, nighttime tends to be worse because let's face it, everything feels worse and scarier at night, right? Even for us as adults, you know, it's dark, we're alone. It's like, oh, everything takes over. So it makes sense. Um, so there's the specific nighttime fears, but then there also is the stress build up throughout the day. And we know, just as you were talking about, when kids are under more chronically high levels of stress, it's going to have an impact usually on their ability to wind down, to go to sleep. So we want to address that kind of from two angles. I'll take the big picture first of just if stress overall is an issue, looking at not just what do we do about that at bedtime when the problem is cropping up, maybe, you know, suddenly it's 930 at night and your kid wants to unload about the 7,000 things that they're, you know, stressed about. We want to be thinking throughout the day. 
how can we support better regulating this child's stress level? So that's going to involve things like, are they moving their body enough? Are we talking about and managing and helping them um, with the things that they're exposing themselves to on, you know, social media and, you know, video games and those kinds of things. Um, are we addressing if school is a real challenge or a serious stressor for your child? Are we working with the teachers to navigate that, to say, hey, this, you know, my child's so stressed out all the time about this. What can we do to make some, you know, supports and accommodations here? So we want to look at it in the big picture. If a child is really just stressed all the time um, to look at how we can build in supports, activities, um, things throughout the day that help regulate and reduce that stress level. Um, but when we think about specifically at night, you know, you might be saying, well, my kiddo seems to be fine during the day, but man, gets closer to bedtime and suddenly we are like on anxiety overload or all of this stuff comes out. Um, there are, are tools and strategies to use, but I want to touch on fundamentally as parents, what is a really helpful formula to think about when addressing fears and anxieties at night with your kids? Because it's somewhat counterintuitive. Typically what happens is kids will start to ramp up with, um, you know, I'm, whether it's I'm scared of monsters, there's monsters under my bed, you know, those kinds of fears, or it's, you know, the ruminating looping about the test that's coming tomorrow or nobody at school likes me or whatever it might be. Our natural inclination, of course, as parents who love our kids, is to say, oh, honey, it's okay. You don't need to worry about that. Let's look on the bright side. Uh, you know, we go into that kind of mode. And mm -hmm. what we unintentionally do there is a few things. Number one, we sort of dismiss the very real and appropriate feelings they're having around that. Number two, we try to distract away from the issue which sort of teaches them like, oh, these aren't things that we actually sit with and work through. These are feelings to be avoided. I look on the bright side or I distract myself with this or that. Um, we also unintentionally, when we go into like fix it mode, trying to get them to feel better, we don't teach them that they are actually capable and competent to manage uncomfortable feelings and thoughts that come up for them. So instead of approaching it that way, the formula that I talk with parents about is, is two pieces. It's acknowledgement along with confidence building. So that sounds like, oh man, I hear that you're so worried about that test tomorrow. You know, I get it. I used to be worried about tests too. That really makes sense to me. I, I, I hear you. You're, you're feeling scared about that. And I know you can handle it. That's so I good. know you can handle it. That's the that's the magic combination to help kids actually learn how to become more resilient, to manage and regulate stress and anxiety. It's both. That's hard for us because we want to soothe our own stress and anxiety in those moments of just getting our kid to smile and feel better. But if in order to really support them through this, especially if you have a child with clinically you know, significant levels of anxiety. It's counterintuitive, but it's really effective and important. I hear you, you acknowledge how they're feeling. You don't argue with them about it. You don't try to talk to them out of it because guess what? They're allowed to have whatever feelings they have. You know, if they feel like everyone at school hates them, you can know in your logical mind that that's probably not true, but that's how they feel. And we need to acknowledge that. Boy, it feels that way to you. That's gotta be really hard, you know? You acknowledge the feeling and you instill the confidence. I know you can handle it. Or here's the three things I saw you do today that have prepared you for that test. So you're feeling really scared about it. And I know that you can handle it. And that combination over and over and over again is what instills that resilience and ultimately what helps them manage those anxious feelings. So you're not getting stuck in this loop every single night of them needing to engage in this round and round with you about talking about it that's bothering them and their fears and whatever and you trying to soothe them and I got to stay with them until they fall asleep because without me they can't and you just get into this whole thing so that's an important piece of the formula along with 
you know, using specific strategies. I'm a really big fan of teaching kids, even from a young age, how to do basic belly breathing to calm their nervous system, how to use things like progressive muscle relaxation, lying in bed and starting at your toes and clenching your feet tight and counting to three and then relaxing and moving up and tensing different parts of your body, really effective. And little kids can learn how to do that. Teaching them some mindfulness techniques. There's lots of apps that you can use now with things like mindfulness and meditation stories that help kids to sort of drop in, soothe, you know, their anxious feelings and, you know, be able to work through that. So those tools are all really important, but what we bring to the mix in terms of how we are responding to those anxieties, those stressors, those fears, really, really important. Yeah. I love the way you describe that. I mean, so much stuff I wish I hadn't had known as a kid. Right. And, and this idea that, and I think just somebody else was asking to clarify what you were talking about when you were describing this formula that ends with, you can handle it too, is you're really talking about not just what we sometimes call in the therapy world, the writing reflex, where somebody presents to you a problem and mm -hmm. rather than making sure that that they know they're heard and that they know it's okay to feel the way they feel and then offering some sort of comfort or or solace you we say you know don't you don't have to feel that way right or you right, don't have right. to you don't yeah. have to think that way and we mm -hmm. kind of accidentally invalidate the way they're feeling and and what you talk about is really tapping into our our, our empathy, mm -hmm. which it are which is a skill that we all have every single human being on the face of the earth has a big stripe in their brain called the anterior insulate cortex that is basically entirely responsible for feeling what each other feel yeah. and empathy. Yeah. And you're really tapping into that and saying, I'm going to first, we're going to mm -hmm. formalize it, right? You're going to validate how you feel and make sure you know it's okay to feel the way you feel. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm going to reflect it back to you, right? I'm going to tell you that I hear what you're saying, and that not only is it okay to feel the way you feel, but I felt that way too. Mm -hmm. And I understand how you feel, mm -hmm. right? And then it makes it doubly okay. And then number three, but we've all been, we, we all go through this sometimes and, and you're going to, you're going to be okay. Or would you like to know maybe some way that you can try to feel That's better? Right. Would you like a potential solution? And then right. they ask you, and then when they ask you, they're actually in a receptive place to receive right. mm -hmm. what you're offering, right? That's right. That's right. It's like, yeah, it, it's that it's that sequence. And then the using tools, like we don't just say, I know you can handle it and, and drop it there. I know you can handle it comes either on the heels of having talked about a plan, use some strategies, whatever, or, you know, I know you can handle it. Let's pick a strategy to use. And kids often do need a prompt for that. Like, hmm, what should we do tonight? Do, you know, should we do uh, squeezing and, and relaxing around your stuffed animal? Should we turn the, you know, the breathing story on for five minutes? Um, let's pick, let's put your Apollo on and let's, you know, set that and let you pick the intensity of it. See what feels right to you tonight. And you engage them in the process of having agency and solving this problem because we want to approach whether it's sleep issues, anxiety issues, whatever the issue might be, we want to approach it as a solvable problem. This is not something that's broken about you. This is not something that we all have to now go, oh my gosh, this never ends. You know, this is terrible. No, this is a solvable problem. You're feeling anxious about school tomorrow. That's a solvable problem. I understand how you're feeling. Yep, I felt that way too. You can handle it. Let's pick a strategy. You know, you're feeling like, you know, you can't fall asleep. Okay, boy, we all feel that way sometimes. I hear you, man. That's really frustrating when it's bedtime, but you just feel like you can't fall asleep. Oh man, that happened to me last week. I totally get it. Super frustrating. We can solve this problem. I know you can get through this. Let's pick a tool. And that's really one of the things like I love about um, the Apollo and why I really got interested in using it with kids for sleep and for lots of other things is there's no barrier to entry. For kids, sometimes it's difficult, depending on their age and developmental level and cognitive ability, to 
help them learn or implement some of, you know, the mindfulness strategies or even, you know, the breathing or cognitive behavior strategies. These things require conscious work and effort and kids aren't always into doing that, right? Especially at bedtime. What I love about the Apollo is there's no barrier. They should be willing to put it on. And actually, I find that they get really engaged then in the process of let's pick how we want to feel right now. Oh, we're trying to go to sleep. Okay, this is the mode that we're going to pick. Now you pick the intensity. I'm going to start it at zero and you move it here on my phone until you feel like that's what you need right now. Let's close our eyes. Just want you to think and feel it. Okay. Now I'm going to move it and you tell me when it feels like it's right for you. And what we're doing there is getting their brain off of the ruminating and the spinning worry, or I can't fall asleep or whatever. And we're getting them engaged in the process of thinking about how can I help myself and how can I solve this problem? And that goes for whether we're talking about using the device in, you know, during homework time or, you know, a sports activity or whatever it is. It doesn't require effort on their part, and it engages them in the process of feeling empowered around implementing a solution and a way to help themselves. And I think that is so profoundly important. Yeah, it's it really is, and it's it's almost like you're you're using the the tool, the Apollo, in a way where you're helping them to get the feeling of agency and control, which is a right. huge anxiety reliever for all of us, right. because as we all, as most of us know, spending time thinking about stuff we don't have control over is like the source of all of our anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're instantly <laughs> taking that down a notch by saying, all right, now you have control, right? You have control over this. And then right. you're also using it as a self-awareness training tool, by and a, which is a mindfulness training tool effectively and saying, hey, despite how you might feel right now, you can actually feel different by just paying attention to this feeling of this thing vibrating in your body. Now, pay attention to how it changes now. How do you feel now, mm -hmm. right? And then you change it. And how do you feel now? And think about how you feel. Let's talk about that. And then you start to give that restore effectively control through awareness back to them, which is so powerful. All right. That's, and it's key to anxiety reduction because stress and anxiety in particular is all about uncertainty management, which goes back to what we talked about at the outset, which is why consistency of routines is so important, especially around sleep. It minimizes the amount of uncertainty that kids are feeling. And when we're feeling more certain and in control, we know what to expect. We have agency in the process that just automatically brings anxiety down because one of the biggest things that gets in the way of kids and adults sleeping is that anxious, ruminating, stressed out mind. And so that consistency, that feeling of control, it's just, it's really key. And that's also why I like using some of the apps. Like I like the cool Koala app is a really nice one with some like bedtime, um, just like mindfulness or meditation stories. Um, but you know, the, these things, whether music, I'm a big one for using music, pick the, the music track that feels right to you. Pick the, the CD or the, the file, the, the playlist that feels right to you tonight. And again, that gives them agency and it helps just provide that consistent, you know, routine. And I'll give a little tip too. I started doing this with my kids when they were infants, um, newborns actually, all the way um, through their childhood. Uh, and I mean, my kids are older and I'm old. So this was back when we had CD players. We didn't have, you know, digital music at that point, but I had a CD player in my kids' bedrooms and I would have, you know, a couple of sleep music, like very quiet, sleep focused CDs. Um, and I would put that, those on at night, I would pick one and put it on and put it on repeat because that builds consistency in the physical environment. And when your child gets used to hearing that music to fall asleep, guess what happens when they wake up in the night and they will, that's normal. They wake up in the night. We want the environment to be as similar as it was when they first fell asleep, because that's conducive to feeling safe and like, oh, I can fall back to sleep. So put those music tracks on repeat through the night to keep that consistent environment. Just a little tip, whether you've got, you know, tiny ones or, or older kids. Yeah, that's a great tip. I, uh, speaking of old, I used to fall asleep to Vivaldi and the Magic Flute on cassette uh, yeah. before there was a repeat function because right. cassette tapes can't repeat. Okay. <laughs> Nope, that's but the, right. 
but but I really like that uh, yeah. that repeat idea of just curating the environment to make it right. familiar, so that if, when they if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're still in a in a state of mind where you're remember you're being reminded right. that hey, this is sleepy time. That's right? exactly right. And it helps you wind back down and and kind of yeah. recenter you in that in that place and yeah. and feel less lonely in a lot right. of ways. And that exactly. consistency that you were describing is so important, right? And I'm, I'm wondering, would you, you know, you've been using and recommending Apollo to your clients as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, the consistency is so challenging at some, sometimes yeah. with kids and teenagers. Yeah. Um, how, do you have any ways that you recommend they use it maybe with scheduling or mm -hmm. things like that yeah. to help them gain that consistency of, of wake up and bedtime and that kind of yeah. stuff? Usually what I will do with most kids, I mean, depending why we're using it, but the, the majority of the time, I'll say this is part of our getting dressed routine. We put our Apollo on because you as the parent can control through the app, the scheduling, the, the use of it. So we just build it into the routine, put it on in the morning, um, and then you have it on. And whether they are old enough to engage with you in setting their schedule or using the app themselves, or it's a younger child and you're doing it for them, then it's on and it's accessible throughout the day. So I love using the scheduling feature, especially when kids are at school, because as a parent, you're not there with them. But if the teacher's calling and saying there's concerns at these times, you can then set up or work with the team at school to set it up in the app so that based on what they're doing throughout the school day when you're not there, the Apollo is supporting them with the right modes, the right intensity during those periods of time. So I like the structure and the scheduling of it for lots of reasons, but I also like it when things come up during the day, like maybe your kid gets home, you know, from a sporting event or their friend's house or school, and man, they are just dysregulated and you're like, whew, we are having a hard time. You say, hey, let's think about, you know, I see you're having a really hard time right now. Let's see what we can do. Let's pick, you know, how it would be helpful for you to feel right now. And they already have it on whether it's clipped on, whether, and I like the clip actually for a lot of kids now, but some of them like to use, you know, especially the younger ones, they feel like they have like an Apple watch or something, right? Like they just feel cool. Like I've got my, I've got my device. And so they like the band. Um, but it's nice to already have it on because you can say, oh, we need some support right now. Like, and, and I'll even have parents where there's a model like, wow, I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. I need to, you know, help myself here. Let's see what would be helpful to you. And it just makes it easier because what I have found is when it's sort of haphazard, inevitably when your kid needs it or when you need it, you're not going to use it because then it's like, oh my gosh, we have to go find it. It's like, where is it in their room? Like, you know, and instead you just build it into the routine of putting it on and having it on. And then it's much more efficient and effective to use it throughout the day. But the consistency is important, especially for something like sleep. Do not expect the Apollo or a meditation track or anything else to work the very first time, you know, right out of the gate. You need to build consistency and a routine and a pattern with it. And that's where you're going to really see the results. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really helpful. And I, I think the idea of especially being able to have your your the, have your kids feel like they can be more in control on the go and feel more agency I think one of the things that's so challenging about being a kid growing up in my memory was just feeling like I didn't have any say in anything right everybody's always making decisions for me they're telling me where to go what to do and you know I barely have you know say over how I feel so I'm going to do I'm going to go drink soda and eat candy. Right. right. And, and that's not, that was not healthy for me. I should have been trying to brush my teeth as much as possible to make them shiny, but nobody, <laughs> nobody told me to do that yeah. in that right. way. Right. Yeah. So. yeah. But also kids will get really resistive. Like some kids will go to like, I'm just going to do the candy and the soda pop. Other kids, if they're really controlling and rigid and resisting everything all the time, that is usually a big red flag that this kid needs help to feel more certainty, more control, more agency over themselves. How can we help to give them spaces and places in their life and in routines where they have a say? And that's where the Apollo factors in so nicely with that, because we can give them agency over playing around with the different settings, the intensity, and choosing what feels right to them in that uh, moment. That's just a really simple, effective way to give them some control in a world that they don't have a lot of control in. 
Yeah, well said. Uh, control and, and the feeling of control, even right. over small things, as you were right. saying, small choices is just, mm -hmm. is not to be overstated. And the more that we can, I think the more that we can work with our kids to help them understand that and that, yeah, they don't maybe have all the say that we do as adults because we've spent our lives earning it, but mm -hmm that there are some things that they get to choose and that they that they too can earn more responsibility over time which then fosters a sense of accountability and excitement around these kinds of things rather than um you know rebellion and right. resentment and there's so much that we can do to just i think as you were saying earlier right it's just making this stuff fun and giving our kids a say in how they not not you still have to go to bed but how right. how you go to bed there are little things that you can still right. um have a say in there and so i'm so glad uh i know we're i think we're at time and i really want to be respectful of your time because i know how busy you are and i really really appreciate you taking the time to join us this was really fun i learned a lot about um my childhood and how <laughs> how uh, I was probably not doing what I was supposed to be doing to have a healthy childhood, which explains a lot of my uh, younger school years. So I know how to uh, be a better dad now with my right. kids. Right. And um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, thank you so much. And um, where can people find you and learn more about your work? Yeah, so they can go to um, two websites. So my clinic website is horizonsdrc.com, but the website where you can really go to get lots of videos, articles, information, my podcast, all of that is drberkins.com. Um, and I'm most active on Instagram. I have a lovely community of um, parents and professionals working with kids there, and that's just at Dr. Nicole Birkins. Um, so yeah, you can find all the stuff there. Would love to love to connect with people. And this was a lot of fun. Um, gosh, that hour went fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. And uh, I want to just let everybody know that this is um, the beginning of our uh, sleep series that we're kicking off, starting with kids. Um, we will have lots more sleep stuff to come. Um, this webinar will be available, so please uh, sign up on our email list if you're not already, and we'll make sure that you get uh, notified as soon as the webinar is live um, for, and sent out for all of you to check out and, and, uh, and catch up on some of the stuff you might have missed. And also, tune in on Monday. We'll be having another discussion about sleep mostly focused on adults with uh, a good friend of Dr. Nicole and mine, Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor, um, who is wonderful and uh, extremely knowledgeable in the space of sleep and how to get more of it. And as he says, how to be better in bed. Right. So thank you so much again. And I hope you have a wonderful and restful weekend. Thanks. You too. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.